Pizzolo has got it. He'll never forget that moment. And the Hawks have got the first three. Justin inaccurate early last week. What can he do here? Onto the right, puts it to a dangerous spot. So dangerous, it is through the middle. Mitch Lewis is a dangerous one on one play. Well done, McKenzie. Oh, look at the pick up. Look at the skill, the orange for Nash. That was outstanding. Mitchell again, great coach. Warple went back. Bird Jones released to Josh Ward. Could this be his first goal in the AFL? Josh Ward, he's got it. Ball spills over. But it's a big win on the road. Yes, Hawthorne reigned supreme over Port Adelaide, the 64-point demolition of Koshy's mob shocking the footy world. And with the Hawks sitting on top of the league, at the time of recording at least, there's no disputing that the Mitchell era is off to a flyer. We're back to recap the magnificent win here on the Hawk Talk podcast. My name is Nick Mason, and joining me is a man who couldn't catch the game live, but knew something was afoot when his phone started blowing up. Good day, Tiz. Yeah, well, I was thinking I'll catch the replay when I get home. You know, if we win, or maybe uh, I'll wait till the morning, find it, you know, just sort of keep the score to the back of my brain. But phone absolutely blew up at half time. Hawthorne supporters couldn't keep a lid on it. <laughs> we all dragged you <laughs> kicking and screaming to spoilers, basically. Well, the first thing I saw was Connor Nash's goal. And I knew things must be going well, because <laughs> that was a ripper. He comes out of screen, straight through. Everyone is equally shocked on the field. <laughs> As is the viewers, <laughs> and he just screams into goal, puts it straight through. Lovely stuff. One of our listeners, Willard, wants to know uh, how many times did Tiz rewatch that Nash goal? Oh, uh, it was a few. Um, I kept showing other people as well. That I counts. Like... <laughs> I don't care how many times you linked it. That counts. Uh, yeah. So I have watched the replay, and um, beautiful team effort. Like the space open to us. The ability to defend onslaughts, because Port Adelaide tried. It wasn't like they didn't get the ball at all. They had a huge number of possessions to some of their best players. And the pressure we exerted on whoever was taking the pass into the forward line was extreme. And eventually it became perceived pressure. It's a wonderful system Sammy's got them working to. I think yeah, that's an astute observation. This wasn't a white flag kind of performance for Port Adelaide. They put in... But they just couldn't do it as well as us. And I think if you look back at the North Melbourne game, obviously, you know, we get the four points, but it didn't go perfectly to script. But I feel like the the, the clash against Port Adelaide really built on that round one, that, that season opener, sharpened everything that was going right for us, and we just let the power have it. We just unleashed. We went, we've, we've refined this now. We're ready to bring what we can to Adelaide, and uh, yeah, it was incredible. Well, I mean, the first quarter hour, 20 minutes, there was no indication, because I knew the score, there was no indication of what was going to happen. There were there were still fumbles, bad options taken, but after quarter time and towards the end of that quarter, Hawthorne started getting a sniff, they got a bit of confidence, and then you notice um, uh, guys like McDonald and Newcomb just taking it up to Port Adelaide players and backing the players behind them to get the ball, like Richmond were doing in the past. They just play off the fact that they would win the ball, which is remarkable because our midfield didn't win the ball in stoppages and clearances and that. But when it's in free play, excellent stuff. So we had a question from one of our listeners, James, at Hawk Talk Pod. The system, can we break down the system moving forward? which I suspect is code for just how did we get this done? How did we look so good against a preliminary finalist from last year? Well, mate, how does Mitch Lewis look this good? (laughs) Uh, I thank you for bringing him up. It saves me from going full fanboy. You don't need that. (laughs) Look, there's been flashes in the past, but these are consistent efforts. And can I just say, I love the fact that Hawthorne put on the Peter Hudson Guernsey and fantastic looking Guernsey with the white bib at the back so you can see clearly the numbers. And then they don't miss a set shot. Now, come on. (laughs) Which footy god is right in the script this week? That's remarkable. The symbolism was exceptional. But, uh, yeah, look, Mitch Lewis, that's a a career best game. Uh, Five goals straight with one goal assist, seven score involvements in all. Uh, You know, I wanted him to be a match winner, Tiz, and we're two games in. And he's playing the part to perfection. And what about his mate in crime, Jack Gunston? Cannot miss. Well, I mean, he can miss. 
He could last week. <laughs> but those goals from the from the boundary line, I mean, he's just devastating. Three in total and two of them absolutely magnificent. Uh, 12 touches at 83.3%. He is... Uh, what he adds to this team is rather remarkable. I think what it is, if we try to break down what... Because it's all about the forward line at the moment. The midfield, let's face it, it didn't break even at all. What won us the game was the movement of the ball on transition. Just precise and aggressive. And what they that does is it lets you have one out, competition, one-on-one, Mitch Lewis and another guy, Jack Gunston and Trent McKenzie on one leg. Looks terrific. <laughs> gives you a real chance. And if you've got Connor McDonald and Warple, who's apparently found some pace, if you can run with that speed into the forward line, defenders begin to panic and you get some really... Look, we, we kick to position, but... They're not even looking at the ball half the time now. They're looking at their position. They're looking at their opponent. It's really good. The focus of our forwards is on the footy, whereas in the past they were the ones trying to get their opponent out the way, trying to make space for themselves. I really enjoyed the transition of the ball movement and the fact that our defence is so good can absorb so much pressure with guys like Sicily and Scrimshaw. And this week, Giath didn't have such a big impact. But the team is a, or the unit of them, Hardwick. I mean, what a fantastic game from him. When I look at the wing play, some of that stuff is delicious. And it was just the kind of speed and aggression that we've been looking for. And it finds teams out. This is a prelim side. I know they've got a few out, which is why, um, you know, Hawthorne came in with a real sniff. It'll be a fantastic contest next week, I think. Certainly Port Adelaide did have a few out, but it was a matter of strategy and system. You know, if if Alir Alir is in Port Adelaide's side and is still getting dragged way out of position, as some of the players were last night for Port Adelaide, then we still win. We still absolutely smash them. Uh, I think that was a key victory, and certainly it wasn't round one, but as I say, refined again for rounds two, this clash. The ability to engineer space and give our forwards the best chance, which, oh my goodness, I've been waiting for that. And we've seen it at Box Hill. We're seeing it here under Sam Mitchell's senior side. Um, I think the important thing to note is, yeah, we got comprehensively smashed in the midfield battle. So you wonder, well, how the hell did we win this game? It is, as you say, ball movement is. And a lot of that ball movement starts from the defensive line. And long-time listeners of the show would know that one of my favourite stats is disposal efficiency right? And I believe in our top five for disposal efficiency, this game, they're defenders. You've got Blake Hardwick, you've got Sicily, you've got Scrimshaw. I think uh, Denver Granger Barash ran at 100%. Granted, he didn't have many touches, but my point is that the guys distributing the footy to start these chains are not only absorbing, 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 as you point out, but they are distributing very, very well and launching us into attack and um, letting our guys get to work and, and engineering all this space in the forward line that leaves the likes of, you know, Gunston. Both of his goals, Gunston, they're, they're not pack situations. Uh, and, and a lot of the time, Lewis was one out with his opponent. This is exactly what we want, and we had it all on our terms last night. And how good is Reeves as well to just be a, a, a sort of statue down the line to break up the contest and let... And they've got confidence that he can bring it to ground. They run past at full pace. Really, really top stuff. Um, I noticed Amira started the game well. Um, he made a point of getting his hands on the pill early and uh, influenced the game this week. Um, but when you look at uh, Connor McDonald with 18 touches, but nine in the last quarter, and his first goal, which I... Just a magnificent goal. He could have kicked another one later. But nine touches in the last quarter gives you an indication of the capacity of this fella. And then you've got Ward, who got eight touches in the third quarter. So we've got two gems, two absolute gems, which we just need to get games into. We've got a couple of newbies that can indisputably match it with these senior players. Like, they belong at the level. 20 touches for Josh Ward. He ran it just 40%, but... You know, you look at something like 26 pressure acts, second only to Warple on the night. 
Uh, Warple had 34, mind you, 19 of those in the defensive half, which is very much appreciated. Connor McDonald, 18 disposals at 55.6% disposal efficiency. His first career goal, of course, there. Five inside 50s for Connor McDonald, and that's the third most for the team. Wow. So these guys have stepped into the lineup, and they are contributing. They're not just making up the numbers. They are playing their part. But what about John Newcomb, who can do it on the inside? We know he can. But Sam said, no, we want you on the outside and you're going to distribute it to the forwards. And he's just hitting up Mitch Lewis as often as he can. Uh, Ten uncontested disposals. And just his spread is... It's 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 really... that you get What I've noticed so far in the season is there's, a, is there's an absence of chess so far. You know, there's not many positional changes or anything like that. He's... Very, I think that comes later once you've got the team working together. But the tic tac toe is going great guns. <laughs> the bit where you just get the defender to come towards you, flick it over the top, get the next defender to come towards you, and then you keep and you move into the space. Working really, really well. But for Newcomb to kick that goal off that free kick from the boundary line, oh, it just it just highlighted this was a. A resurgence. This was a confidence that we hadn't seen at Hawthorne for some time. And we thought they might surprise a few teams throughout the year, being a young team, and they might cotton on to what the game plan was about come around round six. But they are just buying in totally. Like the psychology behind them is go as fast as you can with as accurate passing as you can as often as you can. I love it. The brown and gold buy-in is effectively in motion. We've seen it both rounds now. Uh, I want to retract a statement, something I said before, Tiz, I just became mindful of. Uh, I said that Port Adelaide didn't wave the white flag. That (laughs) that free kick to Newcomb on the boundary was as close to giving up as I've seen in a footy game for some time. We just walked it over, and and the crowd thought it wasn't a free kick. Mind you, they they thought everything was a free kick, yelling ball at every opportunity. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, they're looking for something. Boak had 39, Butters had 29, Amon had 38, Ollie Wines, the current Brownlow medalist, had 36, and yet we still trounced them. And that is a victory for Sam, because he decided that he couldn't match them in the midfield. But what we can do is the ball movement, after they've won in the midfield, win it back. He didn't try to nullify them, didn't try to beat them on their strengths. He beat them with our own. That is really good. And mature coaching. Very promising indeed. Now, speaking of coaching, we had a, had a question from Bobby here at Hawk Talk Pod. Is Hale, as forward coach, getting enough credit? The last few years, our forward line was dysfunctional, but these first two rounds, we've seen our forwards in space, not getting in each other's way and looking very dangerous. How much do we owe to David Hale here? Well, I think McRae managed to get a very good setup, and then he was robbed of Gunston, who has been terrific. Now, Gunston... He can be a marking target, he can win it at his feet, and he can also apply pressure, which is why he's such a great forward. McRae worked on pressure acts, keeping the ball in, that kind of stuff, and Hale has definitely provided better patterns to the leading forwards. And also, if Connor Nash knows where to run to pick that up, uh, everyone in that forward half knows where they need to be to crumb the ball. Yeah, I haven't seen the forward line function this well. For a long time. It's an incredibly well-oiled machine all of a sudden. Uh, Across the park, when we get our game going, we're very strong and look very dangerous. It it starts with the defenders, as it did on this occasion at least. James Sicily with 20 touches and 90% disposal efficiency for 595 metres gained, 9 intercepts. We heard from Jay uh, with a a comment more than a question here. Uh, Not only do we need to re-sign Sicily ASAP, he needs to be captain from 2023. Um, Yeah, well... I mean, if on field uh, things are anything to go by, Sicily is incredibly consistent. Uh, I think we'll get on to Jack Scrimshaw, but he last week had a, had a more difficult role. But this week, while they sat on GF, he did what he liked. <laughs> That's right. I, I tend to think of Sicily and Scrimshaw as a bit of a, a sheriff and deputy relationship. 
<laughs> Scrimshaw is the, the deputy playing his trade. 22 touches at 86.4% for 627 metres gained. I believe that was a team high for Hawthorne and seven intercepts. Uh, you just you can only do so much to nullify this Hawthorne back line. That, that's what I've seen. Uh, Sam Frost even had an influence, even though his efficiency was down. Uh, we, we just had all the answers, and they started from that defensive line. Yeah, I, I thought um, Denver Granger Barras was quiet again, but in key moments he was good. It, it's just a very good back line, and it'll be fascinating to see how it goes against a, a three-pronged forward line in Carlton. So um, we will we will see some uh, very, very interesting sort of counter-attack because that's what we're doing at the moment. We absorb, absorb, and then we counter-attack and spread. And it works really, really well. Um, but we're going to have to absorb a lot more next week, I think. Well, we had a question from Anthony on this uh, topic exactly. Does our back six from the Port game have what it takes to beat the trio for Carlton. We're great interceptors, but not exactly tall. So already some concerns there about how we're going to going to manage them. Well, I mean, we're very good at at spoiling. So we may just bring in... I know Hardigan didn't look so good in the VFL, and I think he copped a knock. But we may need to bring in another or push back another tall player uh, to just break up their attacks. There's quite a few understated games from this Port Adelaide clash. I thought Dylan Moore, yet again, 17 disposals and uh, two goals, two, a team high nine score involvements. He's very quietly putting together a very good season, Dylan Moore. Well, his pressure acts as well. I mean, worrying his opponent out of taking the best option out of defence um, just gives you so much more time to set up and get those intercepts. Um, he's extremely good at that. And his little flick ons and tap ons I'm enjoying that from most of the most of the side are getting into that vein you know just moving the ball on at every opportunity which we saw at Box Hill didn't we that was what they did especially um, I remember going on out on the ground in one of the more slippery days and Sam, <laughs> Sam was just you know we want meter edge we want to you get the ball moving in our direction. I think I have to give you credit also for the call that you made on Connor Nash last podcast. This sentiment that he's solidified his spot in the team, I really think he has. He's backed it up again this game. 16 touches, 12 of those contested at 75% disposal efficiency, one goal and two goal assists. I'm not sure how he falls out of this lineup at the moment. Excellent. Great. Because... Whenever Connor Nash plays midfield, we don't lose. That's uh, basically the tenant of Hawthorne at the moment. It certainly seems to be the case. He's found his spot. It took a hell of a long while to get there, but uh, I, I just I don't know if you remove him from this lineup. I really do think he offers us a very specific service to this team. I'd love to see more tackles from Connor because I know he hurts them, and I think he he missed a few. <laughs> on the weekend but um, the pressure of that midfield group when they couldn't get their hands on the ball first is something you've got to admire because on those stats Port Adelaide should be winning easily well let's go to the stats we had a question from Richard Uh, loved last night but considering we lost the possession count contested possession tackles that's 71 to 52 inside 50s 58 to 46 and clearances 54 to 30 is this game style sustainable? <laughs> it's a fair question. Well, actually, in the past, Clarko argued that this was the most sustainable ball use style. Do you remember? He used to win it back. Win it back, and the best possessions are the ones where you're in space on the outside, the uncontested possession. Contested possessions are fine, um, but you've got to get it to someone who's uncontested who can then distribute. Now, there aren't many players, and we have a player in Box Hill who can actually, whilst in a contested moment, hit a player on the lead, and that's Will Day. There's not many of them in the league. He'll be coming in next week, I'd say. So without a plethora of those types, like you can't get smashed. I'll agree with that. It's too hard sometimes. If the ball use of your opposition is good, and let's face it, Ports was pretty woeful... I mean, you're looking at a lot of 60s and 70s through that midfield brigade. Um, You just can't do that. But in terms of 
how much your body is absorbing in hits and all that kind of jazz, far more sustainable to be able to do that. Far better to concede where your weaknesses are and try and adjust accordingly. Play to your strengths. Well, absolutely. But I'm not saying we shouldn't go and recruit someone. But, I, you know, I don't know what... Um, it, it looks like Tommy Mitchell's really changed his game um, because his, his pressure points were, were pretty high for him, actually. His clearance, he only got five clearances, but it seems like the emphasis isn't necessarily to get to the ball first and get it out first, but just make sure that they can't get through the front of the clearance. Yeah, this is, it feels like a bit of a new Tom Mitchell. This is one of the most nonchalant 28 touch games I've seen from him. I would not have picked that he had that many. I would not have picked that he had 589 metres gained. His efficiency was average, but then, you know, you have that with midfielders sometimes. In terms of a list management ethos, of course, you want a team that can do both. <laughs> but it takes a while to build. So I think Sam Mitchell so far, has uh, the way he's gone about it is to concede our weaknesses, play to our strengths, and working out a way to make it dangerous. But certainly they'd be, they'd be focused on making sure that we don't get chanced in the midfield again. To that degree, no, no, they'd be all over it. I mean, and that... you've got to remember, we've got we we had Ward in there, and uh, although he tackles a lot, a slight body like that doesn't really impact uh, all that all that much. We had a question from Mister Jace, who uh, seems to want to get a bit radical at the selection table. I don't mind it at all. Uh, he proposes perhaps we move O'Meara to Box Hill for the likes of, say, a Ned Long, a bigger body who can win the contested ball. Were you that impressed with Ned Long on uh, on today's game? Yeah, I liked him. Yeah, I didn't. I probably wouldn't have him among the best, but uh, yeah, he's got potential. Oh, he definitely has potential. A pretty pretty raw still. Um, I certainly wouldn't be elevating him off his efforts today. No, not just yet. No, I think O'Meara did some very good work. Uh, you see, I notice it more with uh, medical sub Tom Phillips, but a couple of them are still in the old mould of how we used to play. It, it takes a little while to, in the fog of war to be able to make the new, the new wave decisions that are, that are really working out. That was one of the insights from track watchers in the preseason was there was, you know, early days at least, there was a bit of a disconnect between the old and the new and something that would have to be worked on over time. And I think you're right. It's only once you get into the real deal and you put this stuff to the test that you start adapting properly and um, you you bed these things down properly. But I would say to Mr. Jace, if we get, if we get done on contested numbers like we did on the weekend again, he will be, Sam, I mean, he will be looking at blokes that can hold their own over the footy. It is, after all, a developmental year. Granted, one that's got off to a flyer. I mean, we're 2-0. and oh, Great start, great start. But let's not forget what this year is. And uh, it should be about experimentation. It should be about trying things and, and looking. And, and look, Sam has said that as well. I don't, I don't know why I shouldn't have to say this. I mean, Sam Mitchell has said it himself. Mate, you're not being excitable enough. The only team with a better form line than us, it's with a sense of pride and dread, is Melbourne. <laughs> They're the only... <laughs> Yeah. They're the only team with a better form line. Well, I mean, we're top of the league, so <laughs> say no more as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we had a question from Justin, or more of a comment, really. I still think the midfield was average at best, but Mitchell's game plan was first class, extremely entertaining and exciting to watch. We've seen the blueprint, and I'm fully invested and excited for the future. I think uh, as a last comment on this game, that that really ties a bow in it. I've got to say, I'm on exactly the same page as Justin. I Last night was one of the best wins in recent memory for Hawthorne. It was absolutely outrageous to go over there and do that. Extremely positive feelings. And the excitement to see some of the young boys kick their first goal, their touches, um, John Newcomb doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing. I really tried to, you know, in the interest of balance, tried to pluck some sort of a negative from the game. The best I could come up with was whatever happened to Wingard, uh, Sam Mitchell in the wash-up seemed to allude to the fact that it was just they were just aware of resting him. They didn't want to risk him. Is that the old hamstring awareness? Thing? <laughs> it is the old the old hamstring awareness. Yeah, whether it's more significant than that, I guess we'll find out during the week. I hope it is only 
just they they felt like they didn't want to you know endanger his hamstrings as it were let's just go through stat line uh three touches two goals uh it's not bad <laughs> Oh, he's he's done. He's replicated his round one form, but in a half. So <laughs> brilliant! It it was very enjoyable indeed. I, look, he is very likely, I would say, to be out for the side next week. And with that in mind, maybe we should look ahead. From a sixty-four point win, crushing Port Adelaide, we take on one of the informed sides of the competition in Carlton. They host us at the MCG Sunday, one ten p.m. I'm calling it. I don't think Wingard's going to be in the side. Who are we bringing in? Uh, well, it has to be Will Day, surely. Someone asked me this on Twitter today because uh, I, I was firing off the occasional tweet uh, while Box Hill were playing. Someone asked me, what do we make of Will Day? Is he, is he ready? And I emphatically replied, well, yeah. Why wouldn't you have him back in the side? He looks good to go. Nothing I saw today would give me any hesitation. I would absolutely pick him next week. He got caught holding the ball a couple of times, which was uncharacteristic. He still worked it out to someone, which was... He's incredibly... He has incredible poise to be able to find another option whilst a full tackle is being laid on him. That free kick within context, you know, for anyone that didn't catch the game, the pies were surging. Like, they really just all of a sudden turned up the heat and all of our players were flailing about. It wasn't just Will Day. Yeah, there needs to be something said to whoever's the defensive coach down at Box Hill. Uh, I know neither side could defend, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there needs to be something worked out there. Yeah, it's the kind of game where it didn't seem ever too long between goals for either side. <laughs> uh, so in addition to Day, I would expect that perhaps we have Jarman Impey available, although they might just bring him back through Box Hill, take a conservative approach. Surely he has to get some touch before he comes back in the side. And and where does he get deployed, by the way? That'll be something up to Sammy. Because he's played everywhere for us. He's played halfback, fullback line, uh, wing, half forward, forward pocket, everywhere. Well, just before we continue on the MP train of thought, that did just remind me that uh, you'll be happy to know that Connor Nash has officially played on every patch of turf on the ground now. He's played every position because he was deep in defence last night. So there you go. And he's played ruck. <laughs> ah, it's so good. I've got to get some tram tracks on my new Guernsey. Might get the Hutto one. The Hutto one did look really good. Like, the Legends Guernseys are really nice. Now, we better get back onto what we were talking about with him because we had a couple of questions along the same lines, one from Mitch and one from Numo. The first one from Mitch here, where does Impy fit into the structure of our team when he returns? And then Numo adding, does Impy come straight back into the team? If so, would he be better playing off as a half forward who can hit up a leading target similar, similar to back in 2018? Where would you be putting Impy? I just don't know. I want to put him on half back, but half back or wing, I suppose. Well, remember his poise is is an intercept mark as well. It's incredible. Yeah, that's that's right. That's kind of why I want him still in defence because that's where he's played his best footy for Hawthorne. There's no question of that. And you know, up until he was struck down with injury, 2021 was a career best year for him. Well, let's hope he returns like Gunston did mm-hmm. because he comes off the back of winning the Peter Crimmins. It's an unbelievable return. The medical staff have to be commended in how well Gunston is moving. That's unbelievable. So Impey will be prepared, but I think he needs time. I really do. Give him a couple of games at Box Hill, and it'll be fascinating to see where they deploy him. I did notice at Box Hill they need some inside mids. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Not that he's going to be there. (laughs) I should should emphasise. I'm curious. You put the question to me, but where would you put him? I think his best position is the halfback flank, and also you can you can um, pick and choose your battles a little bit there. You don't have to turn on a thruppany bit, um, that kind of stuff. You can always head backwards with a hand pass, um, but still I'd have him through the VFL and moving up to the wing. And um, look, it's just a it's just a really dynamic outfit at the moment. I uh, I don't see the need for. Impy right now. No, we have the luxury of not rushing these guys back. I mean, if you really wanted to, you don't need to include Day this week. If you really wanted to be super conservative, I don't think it's necessary. You could you could put him in the team just fine. But 
if you just wanted to continue on this track and see what we have with this team, uh, yeah, you could leave him out. Probably too much of an asset to do that, though. We're getting to the G early on Sunday, aren't we? We'll be uh, there with the season guides again, uh, as long as it doesn't rain. Yeah, as long as it doesn't <laughs> rain, yeah, yeah. We'll keep everyone posted about our movements there on social media. Um, but yeah, we, we still have copies of the season guide. So if anyone does want to meet us at the ground, uh, stay tuned to our social channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, all the details will be there later in the week. And I hope you um, went over my grandma with a fine tooth comb because I notice a lot of early readers are getting stuck into the guide, Nick, and I, I'd hate to put them into you know bad grammar at such an early age. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have a lot of enthusiastic young readers. That is some heartwarming stuff right there. We, you know, pictures sent through to us of you know young tackers reading the 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 labor of love that is this season guide that we put so much passion and effort into and see these kids light up with you know with it in their hot little hands ah oh, it's brilliant we got this question from Dr K Mansell Carlton probably looked like the benchmark for clean clearances across two games and i can't see their midfield allowing our transition as easily as ports did have we seen enough improvement from Warple and O'Meara to match their midfield ah oh, no, no 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 we're not matching their midfield I think that's fairly clear. That's And that's not our game either. We've just got to put enough pressure on the midfield that they can't hit up an easy target in the forward 50. We can win the ball back and then spread those guys who are so used to just winning the ball and not having to defend at the contest that they hate running back into their own defence, <laughs> which is exactly what we expose at Port Adelaide. So let's let's hope we can expose the Blues for such poor gut running. Let's make Carlton look lazy. Yeah, they don't do very well with expectations. So <laughs> I've heard they're coming to. Oh, that was about ten years ago now. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the anniversary. Look, whatever the result, and look, some of these young bodies probably uh, will wilt in, in not necessarily this week or. But in future, they'll, they'll reach a point where they need to have a rest. I think we've got some very good troops in Box Hill to be able to afford them that rest. So. And speaking on this topic, I just want people to um, you know maybe calm down just a little bit as far as Liam Shields is concerned. We had a question from Mitch here. Is Shields finished? Depth player this year, then retirement time, or moved on like Lewis and Hodge to top up their super accounts? Uh, look, Mitch poses a good point, I think. There's no no question that Shields is in the twilight of his career, but I don't think we need to panic. It's certainly not the last that we've seen of him. For a start, he's too good. He's still a bloody good player. And as you as you made your point before, Tiz, Ward and McDonald, those kids, they're not going to be in the senior side all year. Fitness management, they've got to manage these young bodies and nurse them through their first season of AFL. Shields will be back, and when he steps back into the side, he'll perform. That is the luxury that is Liam Shields. So it looks like Mitchell is definitely on the bandwagon of getting games into the young fellas as quickly as possible. And perhaps he said to Shields and O'Meara and Mitchell, we only have this many spots for blokes over 26, okay? And that's how it's going to look going forward. Certainly, uh, how it looks like he'll be on the outer for a long time. That might be because of your boy Connor. Well, probably, yeah. But, um, I mean, he didn't play too badly at Box Hill today, did he? How? But, no, no, not at all. But uh, it just, it just, he doesn't have, or, I mean, we've never seen him play the game style. That, but, uh, you know, guys can change their game. We shouldn't limit these fellas because a lot of the blokes in our side that beat Port Adelaide were playing nothing like that last year. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, it's a new look Hawthorne, that's for sure. I, all I'm saying, as far as Liam Shields is concerned, it'll be a bit of hokey-pokey at the selection table. You know, he'll be in, he'll be out, because that's just how it's going to be. This is the changing of the guard at Hawthorne, and he's not going to be guaranteed selection as consistently as he's used to. And it'll be dependent on matchups. yeah. What he does with that, I have no idea. Whether he wants to leave Hawthorne on that basis, who knows? But uh, I just think that's the situation he probably finds himself in. A couple more questions here uh, surrounding our expectations as far as the rest of the season is concerned. This from Aaron. If we beat Carlton this week, do we need to rethink our expected ladder position come round 23? What's our ceiling? And JP Mack followed up with a similar sentiment. Dare we believe 
Or is this the Reese Shaw effect? What can we realistically expect from the rest of the season? The Reese Shaw effect, eh? Wow. Don't take it like that. It wasn't meant to be controversial. No, I, I, I know exactly what it means. I mean, North were awful, and then suddenly they got this attacking, aggressive style, which looked terrific. It shocked a few teams, and they, they were very, very good for some time. But um, it was unsustainable. Um, got to un- underline that. Look, if we beat Carlton, and then we've got St Kilda and Geelong after that, is it? Easter? Oh, it was good to see Buddy kick his thousandth against Geelong. That was good. Did you enjoy that, mate? Yeah, but I enjoyed the little bonus that was uh, Geelong being forced to wait to come back onto the field and lose. Now, Geelong's an ageing list. They don't have time to wait, mate. Yeah, well past their bedtime. Exactly right. You've got to shuffle them off. The chocolate milk was cold by the time they got back to the hotel. Skin on it. <laughs> uh, and uh, Clarko there with the scarf of the swans on. Now, I haven't touched base with you about that. H- How do you feel about Clarko wearing the uh, the swan scarf? Well, I had a bit of a, a cringe, full-body cramp but um <laughs> but uh no he's just there to support buddy isn't he and it's a father figure situation he's supporting his mate and uh you saw how emotional they got when he booted number number 1000 and i just thought it was a lovely moment and how happy was his was his wife she got very excited as well i felt for buddy though being out there in that crowd well so did about 20,000 people <laughs> <laughs> I noticed um, a couple of the young swans were with him for about the first five minutes. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they were up the race at the other end. Buddy had to make his way through the throngs. And uh, oh, as the aforementioned Aaron reminded me on Twitter, I didn't make it to the <laughs> uh, 100th goal game. But um, I did run out for one of the Dunstall once, one of the times he kicked 100. Oh, there you go. See, you've got that. That's something I don't have. Yeah, but I didn't go anywhere near the throng. I just sort of went out and thought, oh, yeah, here I am out on the ground. I'm not going anywhere over near that. Mate, that's all I did in 2008. But, yeah, they were all diving in. And, and I yeah, look, I, I know it's a fantastic occasion. It doesn't happen very often. But playing the music, total mosh pit. I mean, it didn't <laughs> have any. No wonder it took them. I wonder it took them 45 minutes to get them all off the field. We need to circle back around to whatever point you were making. You said if we beat Carlton, we beat St Kilda, we beat Geelong, and then you got sidetracked, reveling in Geelong's misery. I didn't say we beat all those sides. Okay, I'm sorry. I just want to say that if you start off well, then you can really set up your season and, and try to hit finals. You get one final into a couple of these young fellas, that is worth a hell of a lot to their development. So I would. The aim is always to play finals, as we know. And if you're three and zip, you are well on your way to giving that a tick. Because there's a there's a few finalists from last year that look very very vulnerable. Indeed, they do. And I tell you what, if we happen to beat Carlton, check the sides of milk cartons. Where's the lid, Tiz? The lid is missing officially. Oh. Come on, really? <laughs> if we beat Carlton, come on, you can't say that's not worth anything. All right, if we beat Geelong, I'm going to have to have a bet with you about something because uh, that would be that would be totally lids off. I would and I would love it because that would be the end of their era. Totally gone, done, over. Just as I told you the other, like when I got carried away with myself the other day, if we can get Hinkley out of Port Adelaide before the end of the year. Hawthorne can recoup some of that check when Clarko ends up there. Oh. What a fantastic <laughs> idea. No wonder they throttled him. <laughs> I, you know what? I've done this podcast with you for years, mate. Sometimes I still don't know how your mind works. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder Kenneth was so happy. He's looking at the dollars, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth said, now I don't want to get into a big Kenneth chat. This so is the proudest moment for him the proudest this is the pinnacle he's overseen so much other stuff we've won premierships four of them in recent memory he was there for 08 of course yeah no i served him the next day at baker's delight <laughs> that's right yeah and, and then he was absent for the for the three p yeah or he was around the club but not well, well, well jeff, jeff is never truly absent tis i think we know that by now <laughs> 
but I can I can kind of understand where he's coming from because they were very hard decisions in the last twelve months, very difficult decisions for you know for the club and 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 for them to be so quickly uh, ticked off. Uh, I would say for him is is, is great and and it's a of a huge relief. I think what he means is this is the most relieved he has felt. I would say. Uh, if I were to correct him on that, because um, very big decisions. And uh, like Jack Fitzpatrick said, he's still trying to come to terms with how how Hawthorne went and sacked the greatest coach of all time and replaced him with the greatest coach of all time. <laughs> <laughs> the soon-to-be-anointed greatest coach of all time. Uh, look, as far as my expectations go, I'll see where they sit when it comes to the Carlton game, whatever we do there, whether it's a win or loss. Also, it depends how we win or how we lose that game. Um, but I, I I don't think they shift an enormous amount. I still think that we're going to find... We're going to run into problems with consistency eventually. I, I think that's bound to happen. I'm not going to waver from that. So uh, how's that AFL Coach of the Year award looking? The only thing Clarko couldn't crack. <laughs> how ironic would that be? <laughs> Oh, goodness. That tickled me good. We need to talk about Box Hill. Uh, pipped in a classic at Victoria Park, unfortunately. It was an engrossing, seesawing, and highly physical season opener that did come right down to the wire. What a contest it was. But got to say, Tiz, Box Hill would be very disappointed because there was at least minimum three blunders late in the piece that really cost them the game. And they'll see this one as uh, a game that got away from them. Yeah, an infuriating finish and... Uh, there were strings of goals kicked for either side. Um, it was a it was a lesson in momentum. It was a lesson in hold on to the ball when you've got possession. Sometimes, Tiz, when you're ten meters out from goal, you probably don't need to raffle it. <laughs> probably just yeah. close the door on Collingwood, end the contest, put the goal through, but didn't happen. Anyone that uh, caught your eye, Box Hill, Nick? Yeah, well, I mean, all eyes were on Will Day, of course. That's to be expected. And I thought he performed reasonably well. He was among our best. Uh, 21 touches, 7 marks, 4 clearances, and a pretty good goal. Uh, apart from him, really liked the look of Jackson Callow. Number 45? The prestigious number 45. <laughs> 12 touches, 7 marks, and 2 goals won. And uh, played a bit of ruck. But the thing that was the most eye-catching about Callow was what you've come to expect. We brought him into the club to be a, an absolute colossus. Sticky, sticky fingers. Yeah, sticky fingers. A colossus with his contested marking. He brought his A-game in that respect today as well, so he was great. Dan Howe was pretty serviceable. 15 touches and two goals won. Jai Sarong is a player that I expect people will be talking about for a bit. Yeah, he looks like a natural player, like... It's just an innate thing with him. Uh, very nice to watch. Very fluid movement. Uh, good kicking action. Not really sure why he handballed to Will Day for that shot on goal. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> I felt he had the leg. Jai Sarong finishing with three goals, one, and 11 touches. And uh, he seems to have put on a, a little bit of bulk over the summer, which was much needed because when he arrived, he was a beanpole. Well, yeah, not all that much, I wouldn't have thought, but... Um... You know, he can certainly fill out, and he will be a very big lad. Three goals for Sarong, as I said. Uh, Fergus Green finished with three as well. Two goals for Howe, Keller, and Kavara. One goal each to Saunders, Day, Mitchell. That Seamus Mitchell, who marked about five centimetres from the goal line when the ball was probably going through anyway. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Parsons and Gray. Uh, we see Box Hill Hawks in action next against Carlton, of course. Uh, back at home, Box Hill City Oval, Sunday, 3.05pm. Uh, look, unless you're an absolute diehard Box Hill Hawks fan, um, you're probably going to be at the G. There's the clash there, unfortunately. But yeah, it, it's all happening on the one day for Hawthorne. What did you think about Mighty Mouse? I'm not sure how many possessions he had, but I thought he was decent. I thought he tried pretty hard. He was a battler. Yeah, he, he, gets, he gets good touches. He gets good touches under pressure and, and makes good decisions. No, they'll be all right this year, Box Hill. It's a very big league, though, when you look at the ladder. It's uh, quite different to what we used to look at. I look forward to watching Box Hill. Uh, it probably won't happen this week. As I said, we're going to be at the G. Uh, it means I'll also miss out on seeing some more VFLW. They're also playing on Sunday at 11.30am, looking to continue their winning streak, Tiz. 
they moved to a four-game winning streak with another win over North Melbourne, 47 points. That's a big win. Not quite as big as their round one clash, but um, yeah, I mean, it's still dominance anyway. you slice it. Bit of an arm wrestle to begin with, and then second half, they just came out and put the hammer down. Uh, it was a comfortable win in the end, as I said. Similar result. Christy Stratton with two goals, who's becoming a pretty reliable uh, source of goals for the Hawthorne VFLW outfit. And our latest signing, Barbacos, looked dangerous and ended up with a goal on debut. Probably should have had more, but um, it's, it's coming together. There's something building. We should underline that there was a number of changes to that lineup due to signings to Sydney. So that's a tremendous result for that side to keep keeping on the way they do. And they did it without their captain too, uh, which I noticed almost immediately while I was streaming the game. I thought to myself, where is Tamara Luke? Because she, to the, to this point, has had an enormous influence on our games. And so it's very noticeable when she's not out there. Unfortunately, suffered a hamstring injury at some point. So we're going to be without her for a while. But uh, look, if this team can keep on rolling on as it did on the weekend, uh, look, they're very exciting indeed. They're back in action against Carlton, uh, Box Hill City Oval, Sunday, 11.30am. So, um, yeah, another one that's probably a bit tough to get to if you are desperate to get to the G. Gee, they're really hipping it all together on the Sunday. You're going to uh, have to take a power pack for the phone. <laughs> that's right, yeah. It's a big brown and gold Sunday. All of our teams playing on the one day at almost the same time. <laughs> well, that's just about it for this episode, mate. And I've got to say, it's... Um, isn't it great just riding the wave? We've put this one out a little bit earlier than usual. Uh, we, we've just got a bit of a hectic week, both our schedules. and But, you know, it, it just made sense to hit record ASAP, ride the wave of positivity that uh, all of our supporters are doing. Yeah, and uh, take away from what is coming from Kane Corns, probably, uh, who obviously feels that Port Adelaide's list is at a far better state than ours. And... Uh, it's a poison chalice that Sammy Mitchell has been handed. And uh, I wonder how he felt at the end of that game, Nick. I really do. Because, uh, it, yeah, it just every time Port Adelaide look likely, uh, they're pretending. And it's wonderful. R.I.P. Keynes mentions. <laughs> he would not have had a fun time on social media. <laughs> you know what? I, I was swept up in that. I mean, not not on the Kane stuff. Admittedly, I did tweet him. I mean, once. Yeah. But... You know, he keeps coming back to the same well and, and it never works out for him. One of our listeners, I think, tweeted uh, David King having a, you know, ribbing on him for um, his outlandish prediction, you know, back in the 2014 grand final. The 68 points. Yeah, I'll never forget. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the one. Yes, yeah, so they, they made a callback joke to that. And uh, David King replied. And of course, the Hawk Talk podcast account was tagged in it. No. And David King simply said, you guys need a hobby. <laughs> and I felt like replying... <laughs> Well, I have a hobby. <laughs> this is the hobby, David. Anyway. And a lot of people enjoy what we do. They can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. We do encourage you to do that. Plenty of listeners have taken the, the time out of their day to do exactly that, including Ray B. Dollins with this five-star review. Great to meet you and put faces to the voices that I have enjoyed listening to for the past few years. Love the season preview and so nice to start with a win and feel the positivity of the Round 1 podcast. Keep up the good work, and let's hope for the same outcome in round two. Big tick. Big tick, Ray. Uh, no clips for North, Nick. Getting soft, mate. I'd have to second him on that. <laughs> he didn't go anywhere near hard enough on North. Um, perhaps you felt they were under man, and Hawthorne really weren't that good, Nick. But round two has shown you that Hawthorne really are that good, and North are absolutely putrid <laughs> in only beating a ramshackle group of tired footballers um, by 15 points. Yeah, it's pretty mediocre stuff. Look, like I admit there was a, a distinct lack of clips for North Melbourne, but I suppose since they became wooden spooners, it just doesn't seem sporting. It's not really worth my time. I'd like to think I'm above it. Maybe sometimes I won't be, but for the most part, it's boring when they're that bad. Yeah, don't use all your material early uh, we still play him again this year exactly right i'm saving it up well now I've, I've got a clip from ray speaking of giving out clips i've got one from one of our listeners so i better i better save my ideas for the next time we play him anyway uh twitter at hook talk pod that's where to find us we've hit another massive milestone 3300 followers the ever-expanding community around this podcast is up and about at the moment as you might expect 
They're a passionate bunch over at Facebook too, facebook.com slash hawktalkpod. And you can find us, of course, on Instagram. And lastly, as always, we'd like to acknowledge the support of our proud, passionate, and paid up Patreon subscribers tiers. They make a very real contribution to this show. Uh, All the time and effort and love that we put into this passion project of ours, which is quite a lot, you guys make it possible. You guys that have signed up and support us. We've had another subscriber, in fact, come aboard. Welcome, Trent, you bloody legend. Thanks for getting around us. And uh, for anyone that hasn't joined us on Patreon yet, if you do want to, there's the place to head, patreon.com slash hawktalkpod, and check it out. Now, something that is up there for fourth round subscribers is uh, the season guide. There's a digital copy awaiting you if you sign up at that tier of the 2022 season guide. And of course, Tiz, as you alluded to earlier in the show, uh, will be selling them. Round three, so that's Sunday. Ahead of the first bounce against Carlton, we'll be back at the MCG with copies of our season guide. Strictly limited copies available. If you're keen to grab one, uh, meet us, I guess, around midday, just after midday. All the details are going to be up on our social media channels, as I said. We'll post them there, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you're on there, you'll know where to find us. And I apologise for missing Hawk Talk back on Twitter. That would have been fun, Nick. Would have been Everyone would have been up and about talking finals, I imagine, and uh, dynasties. and uh... <laughs> Not quite. I think people were trying to contain your excitement as best they could amazing stuff just just incredible from the footy club mitch lewis he's finally arrived mate how do you feel it's been a bit of a modest show for me hasn't it i didn't spend too long celebrating that i feel like i missed it all during hawk talk back i feel like you must have put it all out there <laughs> yeah that, that could be the case uh <laughs> five goals straight and becoming every bit the player that i'd hoped for you can read about it in the season guide you can hear about it in our last couple of podcasts in particular, my hopes for Mitch Lewis as a match winner are coming to fruition. And it's, dare I say, really pleasing. The Hawk Talk podcast is in a real sweet spot, mate. My boy Mitch picks 76, by the way. In case you forgot, he's stepping up. Your boy, all the way from Ireland, Connor Nash, he's stepping up. Don't forget John Newcomb. I reckon that's the best pick. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Halfway through the season, pick this kid up, and he does that. Uh, just, I'm a real rap for that boy. It's all pretty bloody lovely when you're winning, isn't it? As we look ahead to uh, Carlton versus Hawthorne at the MCG, Sunday, 1.10pm. As I said, we'll be there beforehand selling guides, so make sure you come and meet us if you want to grab a copy. And of course, after the game, we'll be back with a brand new recap episode. And hopefully, celebrating a third win on the trot. Imagine that, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind... That's the Hawk Talk Podcast for another week. We are a happy team at Hawthorne.